15,000 years ago, these ancient caves of southern Europe were sacred to Paleolithic man. It was here that Stone Age people painted and carved pictures of animals, images which were a central part of the rituals performed before they went hunting. There are mysterious images of wild horses and mammoths, giant elk and bison, animals which roamed across the continent of Europe in prehistoric times. The mammoths and the giant elk are gone forever. But the European bison is not just a memory enshrined in a cave painting. Survivors of the Stone Age fauna still exist in a tiny fragment of primeval European forest in Poland. Descendants of the wild horses of Europe roam this ancient woodland. Through the ages, fate has repeatedly intervened to save the Polish forest. In this century alone, it has suffered the violent effects of both world wars and yet survived. Many historical figures have fought to possess it only to lose it to greater powers. Medieval kings of the Jagiel dynasty, the imperial Tsars of Russia, the German Kaiser and his army, and the sinister Hermann Goering of Nazi Germany. The story of the primeval bison forest is one of conflict, destruction, and regeneration. The fortunes of Europe's bison are closely linked with the continent's forests. First, a look at the fate of the bison's habitat. The primeval forest grew up after the last ice age in Europe around 12,000 years ago. The destruction of the wildwood began in earnest 5,000 years ago. The deciduous forest once stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to the Ural Mountains in the east, from the frozen wastes of the north almost to the Mediterranean. The trees were burnt and cleared to graze livestock and to grow crops, and felled to provide firewood and timber. The original area, once thought to be endless, shrank and shrank. But one fragment of the thick primeval forest has remained untouched in the middle of Europe on the Polish-Russian border. It's called Bielwieża. Today, much of Bielwieża is commercial forestry, but a small central area has never been cut down. It gives a glimpse of Europe as it once was thousands of years ago. How the bison forest was saved from complete annihilation is a story with many historical twists and turns. Visitors to the Białowieża National Park in Poland travel as they have always done, by horse or on foot. Vehicles have been banned to reduce disturbance and pollution. The total area of the forested zone is around 200 square miles, but the ancient untouched forest, or Puszcza, is just three miles by five. <laughs> the 
these 250-year-old trees are around 160 feet high. To understand a man, you must know his past. To understand the trees, you must know their past too. This fallen oak started life as an acorn in the 14th century. It blew over in a storm only 10 years ago. King Jugiel of Poland made camp under it after an epic hunt in 1409. Bjolwieja was the private hunting reserve of the powerful Jugiel dynasty and the bison were royal game. Poachers and woodcutters were put to death. A harsh regime, but one that did protect the forest. The Polish kings and princes of Lithuania dominated Central Europe until 1795, when the Russian Tsars conquered Poland and in turn took this prize forest for themselves. They built a splendid palace at Białowieża to house the Russian court for the hunting season. The Tsars even built a railway line to the forest from Moscow. A hunting breakfast in Bialvieja for one of the Archdukes. Tsar Nicholas and Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna. While the Russians overstocked the forest for sport, they did at least preserve the last few hundred of the hundreds of thousands of bison that once roamed across Europe. Despite the carnage, this living museum of primeval times survived into the 20th century. The discordant hunting calls have passed through the generations of forest guards to the present. Hunting still goes on in the surrounding forest today. But of greater interest in the battle for existence here are the animal hunters pursuing their quarry. There are several packs of wolves in Bielwieja. Their prey in winter is wild boar. Like the bison, wolves symbolize the survival of prehistoric Europe here. In ancient times, wolves and humans were in direct competition. To survive through the northern winter, they had to fight over exactly the same prey animals. Since those days, humans have feared and persecuted wolves. Wolves are now extinct in 11 European countries where they once roamed, and there's little chance of re-establishing them. There's no way for them to live. What was once a great forest stretching from Brittany to Moscow is now a prairie. In the days of Robin Hood, one imagines a landscape of spreading oaks stretching as far as the eye can see. Bjolvieja is that forest. The ancient mix of trees here includes pines and spruce, as well as oak, hornbeam and lime. There's no better time to experience the atmosphere of the forest than in late spring. The pines grow tall and straight to ensure a place in the 100-foot high canopy. It seems more like a rainforest than a European woodland. It can be as damp and humid as any rainforest. The peat bogs are often 20 feet deep.
In the drier parts, vegetation is scarce. Little grows in the gloom of the forest floor. The canopy of leaves steals all the light. The forest has the feeling of the interior of a vast cathedral. As in any ancient structure left to itself, the pillars eventually collapse. The roots tear out their shallow soil foundations. The disks of earth stand, the trunks lie where they fall. But the fall of the trees creates room for a new generation. In the opening in the forest, light reaches the ground, and so the tree seeds have a chance to grow. But the odds are stacked very heavily against their ever reaching the canopy. The acorn crop has scarcely hit the ground before the bison move in. In other parts of the forest, wild boars eat the acorns before they have a chance to grow. The wild boars may destroy acorns, but they do have their advantages. They plough up the forest floor as they look for food. Once the acorns are buried, they have a better chance of getting their roots down. An acorn runs just the same risk of being eaten at night as during the day. The floor of the forest is the home of a large number of nocturnal mammals, including bank voles and yellow-necked mice. With the constant attack from the mice, the bison and the boar, Perhaps only one in a thousand acorns even starts the race for a place in the roof of the forest. From underground, a pine vole puts paid to three weeks' growth. The pine vole has a family to feed. The struggle for existence is brutally competitive on the forest floor, but the dynamics of competition do make for a profusion of life. There are probably more species here than in any other single habitat in Europe. There are some saplings which escape the onslaught of the mammals. They keep on struggling upward through the darkness of the trees into the light flooding down through the gap in the canopy. Once the sapling is several feet high and out of reach of the mammals, it will begin to grow substantial roots and a woody stem and develop toxins to deter further attack. These are spruce seedlings working their way up to the sunlight, filmed over several days.
the spruce's seed case is lifted up on the stem before the spiky needles, the first of millions, open up and cast it off. Spruce seeds take root wherever they fall, even on the trunks of rotting trees. With luck, the roots will grow down into the soil. In Biol Vieja, the spruce is one of the most successful species, outstripping the oak, the birch and the maple. When the Russian Tsars overstocked the forest with bison and deer, the young trees were devastated and there was no regeneration. But at least the animals were protected. In 1914, that protection suddenly ended. Tsar Nicholas II prepared to fight off the German invasion from the west. It was to no avail. The Russians were driven out of Poland, and in 1915, German troops occupied the forest with disastrous consequences. Of 700 bison, every single one was shot for its meat, along with 2,000 wild boar, 700 elk and thousands of deer. Later, five million cubic feet of timber were taken out. It might have been the end for the European bison. This was the last place they existed in the wild. But fortunately, several individuals had been sent out to zoological gardens by the Russian Tsars. When Poland became independent after the First World War, the government gave protection to Bielwieża. In 1929, three bison were brought here from Sweden and put together with three from Polish zoos in an enclosure in the forest. The union proved fruitful and the herd slowly began to increase. It was during this period that Polish scientists began to study the bison they had saved. The European bison is marginally smaller than its American counterpart, but has rather longer horns. The bulls are formidable and weigh up to a ton, making them the heaviest land animals in their respective continents. They are members of the cattle family, but no one has ever managed to tame them. Even the Moscow State Circus failed. Over the years, the Polish scientists have found out much about the bison's social behavior. A herd is usually led by an older female, a matriarch who dominates a herd of other females and their calves. The bulls usually live on their own, roaming different parts of the forest until the rutting season. They horn the trees aggressively. They also roll energetically on the forest floor. The bulls then search out and join the cow groups, waiting for them to come into season. In the 1930s, the number of bison in Bielwieża had crept up to a total of 13. They were carefully guarded, but the forest region as a whole was still an official hunting ground for state guests of Poland. In 1937, Hermann Göring of Nazi Germany came here to shoot lynx. An obsessive hunter, Göring was very taken by Bielwieża. Even at this stage, he may well have been calculating how to take the forest for himself when the Nazis invaded. He had a great interest in the original fauna of Europe. 
On his next visit here, after the Nazi invasion, he was to steal some of Bielwiezer's forest horses and take them back with him to Germany. They're known as tarpans. One of their distinguishing characteristics is a dark line down the back known as an eel stripe. The tarpan became extinct in the wild in the 18th century, but like the bison, a few were kept in captivity elsewhere in Poland. Unlike the bison, the tarpans had been interbred with domestic stock. In the 1930s, selective breeding, back breeding for the original wild horse characteristics, recreated the primitive forest horse. The Bielwieja tarpans closely resemble the paintings made of wild tarpans 200 years ago. But whether the tarpan is the wild horse that man painted 15,000 years ago on the walls of the caves of southern Europe, we will never really know. However, since the tarpan survived in Poland's forests longer than anywhere else in Europe, it is appropriate that it has been brought back to life here. The tarpan was bred in Bielwieja in the peace of the 1930s until that peace was suddenly shattered. The Polish cavalry prepared to resist the Nazi invasion of September 1939. The Poles fought valiantly, but they were no match for their Nazi aggressors. The old Vieja was the scene of brutal fighting before it was overrun. On the orders of Goering, the bison were strictly guarded. Goering had a monstrous plan to depopulate the whole of northeast Poland and turn it into a wilderness for hunting. So, if nothing else, the bison were protected after the Nazi invasion. But five years later, the forest was to be overrun again from the east. <laughs> For the villages of the Bielwieja forest in Poland, World War II brought terrible atrocities. During the Nazi occupation, the Polish resistance operated in the forest. The Nazis eliminated anyone suspected of helping them. 900 villagers were shot. On July the 17th, 1944, the Nazis were ousted from Bielwieja by the Russians. But the question of its ownership was disputed. Should the forest belong to the Soviet Union or to Poland? When Stalin met the Polish leaders to discuss the border, he wanted to include the forest in Russia. It is said that a bottle of Polish vodka persuaded him to move the line so that the special primeval forest section was just inside Poland. The Russians retained two-thirds of the total wooded area, but not the ancient wildwood.
the Narevka River flows from Russia across the border into Poland. In 1956, a pair of beavers slipped out of the Soviet Union down this river. The clue to their presence in Polish Bielwieża is these leafless birch trees. They're dying because their roots are flooded. Beavers aren't often thought of as a European species, but like the bison, Europe was where they first evolved, not America. They died out in Bielwieża in the time of the Russian Tsars. However, in the peace since the last war, the new colonists have done well. During the late spring and summer, the beavers build dams across the streams, flooding up to a square mile. They kill many trees by drowning the roots. But there are benefits to man, for the dams help to regulate floods and erosion and to maintain the water table, and that's quite apart from the beavers' own peculiar charm. Beaver dams are often full of fish. Since the beavers are strictly vegetarians, the fishing is open to others. A small pike attracts the kingfisher's mate. This is a raccoon dog by the beaver dam. Raccoon dogs are secretive carnivores and feed on frogs, fish and birds' eggs. They came from Siberia originally, but were introduced into European Russia as fur animals, subsequently crossing the border like the beavers. The dam surrounds the beaver's island lodge. Inside, the family members are secure and can dry off after swimming. The mother suckles her young, known as kits. They stay with their parents for up to two years in a stable family unit. The beavers provide food for many animals. The dam creates a swampland of willow and reeds, attracting deer. The elk is the largest of the deer family. Adults are the size of a horse. The calves are born in June. Like the beaver, the elk first evolved in Europe. It was later that they spread to America, where they're known as moose. European storks come to catch frogs in the beaver dam and to drink, but they nest well away from the forest. The storks nest on buildings like the Bielwieża Park headquarters. They bring in sticks throughout the summer and the pair use the same nest year after year. There's a stork's nest on top of one of the palace buildings of the Russian Tsars. 
The palace itself was burned down by the Nazis, but this smaller hunting lodge survived. In summer, the storks feed in open clearings and sometimes in the broader glades of the forest. It's often a beaver dam that creates an open space like this. Having felled the trees, the beavers move on. The forest might then encroach again, but the browsers like elk, red deer and bison come in and keep the land open. Wild boars like these clearings too. There is more food to be found here than in the depths of the forest at this time of year. Piglets are born in a shallow nest that the sow excavates, lining it with twigs and grass. Then after about a week, she takes them out. Wild boars will eat anything from truffles to rotting meat. In this case, there's something in the ground below the log, perhaps a nest of bank voles or insects. At the end of summer in Bialvieja, the silence of the forest is broken by the roaring of the deer. In Britain, the red deer is mainly a highland species of the open heather, but this is not a matter of choice. They're really forest animals. Forest stags grow to a massive 450 pounds or more, or twice the size of a British stag, and they have the most exceptional antlers. The stag holds a harem of hinds and roars at the opposition. A strong roarer will usually keep off small arrivals, but the stags will fight if they're evenly matched. This stag has broken an antler while battling for supremacy. the stags this is a strenuous period but they actually eat less now there isn't time for serious feeding when they're involved in the battle of passing on their genes to future generations a stag can hold a harem for only a week or two before he tires hinds take little notice of the roaring. They're feeding in earnest in preparation for the cold days ahead. Autumn arrives suddenly in this area of Poland, out on the exposed plain of Central Europe. The bison are in the last throes of the rut. The great bulls pursue the cow groups with unexpected grace for animals that weigh a ton.
forest mellows. The chlorophyll that once coloured the leaves green is withdrawn down the stems into the tree. Without the chlorophyll, all the blemishes on the leaves become apparent. After a season in the sun spent manufacturing food for the tree, the leaves are damaged by wear and tear and by insects. Soon they'll be shed to decay on the forest floor. October is a month of decay. Honey fungus attacks the weak and rotting trees. Through this fungal action, the nutrients that are locked up in the trunks will gradually be released back into the forest. Gyroporus is a symbiotic fungus that grows on the roots of pines. Like honey fungus, it takes energy from the trees, but in exchange for minerals. The fungi are then eaten by the forest animals, including spindle-shelled snails and slugs. Like the slugs and the snails, these voles are indirectly feeding on the trees via the intermediate fungus in a small but persistent way. By such action, the dead wood is transformed into life. Not all the tree's energy is quite as inaccessible as the wood fibres. The fruits are directly available. A birch mouse feasts on a rowan tree. As a strictly nocturnal animal, the northern birch mouse is rarely seen in Bielviesia. One of its many attractive attributes is a strong prehensile tail which it uses as a fifth limb to steady itself up in the canopy. There are other rodents at work during the night and the early hours of dawn. When beavers get to work in autumn, they account for many trees. This is acceptable in the Bielviesia National Park, but it is not compatible with commercial forestry. That's one of the reasons beavers have been hounded out of most of Europe. They are really remarkable animals. They can cut and carry timber, often excavating canals to do so. They can build dams and reinforce them with mud and stones. They can make lodges and accumulate food stores. And it is all for one purpose, to make a safe family home for the winter. During the winter freeze, the beaver diet consists entirely of the bark of trees which the pair have felled and stored underwater in the mud. From the lodge, they will dive below the ice to get at these supplies. Even though they have good fat reserves, Beavers don't hibernate. Disregarding its tree felling habits, the beaver's demise throughout Europe can be attributed to the value of its fur. The raccoon dog is a fur animal too, but it has been much more successful. It's not so easy to trap, and since its introduction into European Russia, it has invaded Poland, Germany and Switzerland. The raccoon dog infiltrated Bielviesia in 1955. It was the first new mammal species there for perhaps 5,000 years. 
Like the beaver, the raccoon dog doesn't hibernate. But in the trees, smaller animals are starting their winter sleep. Inside the broken birch tree, a birch mouse dozes fitfully. It will sink into a state of torpor when the temperature drops below five degrees. Ultimately, the outside temperature will fall to minus 40. The first snows come in early November. The tall trees give shelter from the winds that blow from Siberia. The trees will also provide most of the red deer's winter diet of bark and saplings. Winter is the traditional time for hunting, and in the areas of commercial forestry, there is licensed shooting of deer and wild boar. In 1985, it was decided to hunt the wolf again after protecting it for 14 years. The forest guards know in which block of forest the wolves are lying, and they're surrounded with lengths of brightly colored flags. Up to three miles are used altogether. The guards then drive the wolves towards the hunter. The hunter is from Switzerland. He has paid a few thousand dollars for the privilege of shooting a wolf. Western currency is much sought after in Poland, and this was the official justification for the hunt. The wolf sees the flags as an impenetrable barrier and will not cross the line. It's hemmed in by the flags and the forest guards. In the winter of 1985, four wolves were killed, leaving only about 15 in the forest of Bielwieża. Even if it does bring in foreign currency, a 20% cull of the population is impossible to justify, particularly in an area which has such a reputation for saving animals from extinction. It has, after all, taken 50 years and complete protection to re-establish a viable herd of free-living bison. There are now around 250 bison in Bielwieża. Like the deer, their strategy for survival in winter is to eat bark and saplings. But the primeval forest is too small and the surrounding forestry too valuable to sustain damage winter after winter. So the bison's diet is supplemented with hay, 400 tons of it a year. The idea is to restrict the amount of tree damage by attracting the bison to several small areas of the forest. However, the bison's taste for hay sometimes leads them out of the forest into the villages. The dog backs off. The 
great bison seem unnerved too. When a group of bison persistently steals hay from the village, the bison guards have to trap them. The trap is tested and the bait is set. The trail of hay brings in red deer too. One bison is caught. The rest will probably be more difficult. When the rogue bison are finally trapped, they're moved well away from the villages. Today, the herds have bred so successfully that the scientists at Bielwieża are also trapping to establish several more herds in Poland. This party is destined for the Borecka forest further north. A bull bison is not to be fooled with. It can charge at 30 miles an hour. That's an eight-foot fence, and bison have been known to jump it. The bison are loaded into crates under the watchful eye of the bison master. Restoring the bison to different parts of Poland is now one of the major projects. Disease or other natural disaster is less likely to threaten the species if breeding groups are widely dispersed. No such threat faces the tarpans, for there are already several herds in the country. The tarpans do not seem to feel the cold, even though it's 20 degrees below. Their thick coats are very pale. It may be a winter camouflage evolved by their ancestors long ago against the predators of Ice Age Europe, predators that included Stone Age man. The ancient forest of Bielwieża is recognized throughout the world as a standard against which man's impact on European forests can be measured. It may be only a fragment of our primeval past, but it is still just large enough to offer protection to animals like the beaver and the wolf and the bison that might otherwise be known only through the paintings in a few prehistoric caves in southern Europe.